It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our uh, seminar speaker today, uh, Kim Whitehead. Uh, he's a social professor of chemical and biological engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. He received his PhD in chemical engineering with Doug Clark at UC Berkeley before doing his postdoc work with David Baker at the University of Washington. Uh, he then started his, uh, his own research group at Michigan State University before moving to the University of Colorado Boulder. <coughs> He has received numerous uh, awards and recognitions over the years, which includes an, an, an uh, on NSF career and young investigator award in types. His lab studies general engineering rules to redesign biological organisms for detail, uh, desired purposes with focus areas on biomolecular recognition, small molecule control of cellular processes, and biomanufacturing. Today, he's going to tell us about some of the latest ongoing work in his group, including the massively parallel high throughput of platforms his group has developed for measuring protein functions to learn sequence function relationships. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Whitehead. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming. It's been a fantastic about 24 hours on the. Uh, on, uh, uh, since I set foot in the state, uh, gorgeous weather. You can thank me for bringing the great weather. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see if I can, uh, re repay that with a, with a decent seminar. Um, so this is, uh, this is my son when we moved to Colorado in 2019. Um, and, and this is him now telling us that safety is important, right? So if you have nothing else, let that be your take on message, uh, for today. Um, so the general motivation for um, uh, for this talk is that um, when we think as engineers about proteins, uh, we don't think just about muscle milk, but also the, the fact that they play a, an immense role in medicine as well as industrial. Um, and um, for, from anything from the, the mRNA vaccine that you took was an engineered protein, uh, an mRNA sequence encoding an engineered protein, uh, to uh, when you when you uh, wash your clothes uh, over the weekends, right? You use engineered proteins in that uh, detergent. And so, um, usually, a central motivation for this is that we can think about. Um, Typical or natural proteins you source are not perfect for the job. They're not a perfect vaccine immunogen, uh, but you can go and actually modify them using protein engineering techniques. And so the, the major challenge in this field is that the sequence space that you can go and uh, design around is, is completely uh, astronomical, it's vast. And so what I'm plotting here on the, on the y-axis are the number of possible protein sequences um, for kind of, uh, if, if for the generalists in the audience, um, the, you can conceptualize a, a protein sequence as a string of litter, little uh, alphabet letters like M or R and S and A and Y and G. And if you start to change them to different amino acids, those those uh, the, 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 or different letters, um, the number of sequences you can get um, for very few mutations from starting sequence uh, starts to outnumber the number of grains of sand on the Earth, right? So it, it becomes very, very challenging um, from just from a combinatorics perspective. And so my independent career in the last 10 years or so, first at Michigan State and then in Colorado, has been on uh, harnessing data revolution to engineer biological systems. And I think that um, kind of we occupy um, the space kind of between uh, directed evolution or, or using evolutionary processes to go and uh, make better uh, biomolecules, including protein. This is exemplified by the 2018 Nobel Prize from Francis Arnold, um, as well as using completely computation to go and design our sequences. Um, and this uh, most prominently is from the lab with David Baker, where I did a postdoc. Um, and, and, and the key insight uh, that we have is that protein sequence space is fast, but it's sparse. And, and what that means in practice is that most of those 20 kajillion combinations are, are not going to be functional. And, and going and separating those out uh, and really focusing on the few uh, or, or the subset of that space that's actually functional will give you big rewards. Um, to do that, we use, uh, in my lab, uh, ha has developed and pioneered in some cases massively parallel measurements of protein function uh, to learn these type of sequence function relationships, to navigate that sequence space effectively. Um, how this works in practice is we take a, um, 
a, a certain starting uh, sequence, uh, whether that's a nucleic acid sequence or the encoded protein. We make large mutagenic libraries of that protein sequence of interest, and we pass it through some high throughput screen of selection. Um, I know there's a lot of generalists here, so I, I will, I'll speak generally for now, and we'll get into some of the weeds a little later in this talk. And then we use um, a technique called deep sequencing or uh, next generation sequencing to go and assess um, each of those uh, mutations that we encode in that library before and after that selection. By that frequency change, we can determine some property of that protein. And again, this is general, and I'll go and talk a lot more uh, about this in a little bit. So um, uh, as, as Juwan said, we use these measurements to learn general engineering rules. Um, previous research that um, my lab did was really focused on understanding um, uh, properties of a, a, a class of proteins called enzymes. Um, and we also worked, uh, dabbled, dabbled our toes a little bit in, uh, in, in, in therapeutics, most, most commonly antibodies. What we're working with right now at Colorado, since I moved, uh, we've been able to kind of uh, expand our research program in some places and shut it in others. Um, we work on controlling life with small molecules. How do we design uh, proteins that can go and sense uh, given small molecules and control cellular actions? We want to understand the interplay between viral and antibody sequence diversity. Um, and then something I won't talk about, but uh, we have projects on kind of improving biomanufacturing uh, for, for protein, most notably uh, the Impossible Burgers that I love, okay? Uh, so, uh, so for today's talk, I'm really going to tell you uh, vignettes on, on two of the three active research programs in my lab. Uh, the first is predicting antibody development pathways. Um, this is by Monica Kirby, who's shown here in Cuba, smoking a cigar. <laughs> I think it was snowing, and, and then she sent me that picture. Uh, also, Brian Peterson's there. This is mostly unpublished. Um, uh, but we should have a, we should have a publication of our archive in the, in the next month or so. Um, and then collaborators include Brandy Dukowski, who as told was here last month, uh, giving a seminar, as well as Jenna Guth Miller at, at CU Anschutz. And, and then the second more complete story, um, that I'll spend half of my lecture talking about is rapid biosensor development, um, and, and, and how do we make or design proteins to go as, respond to small molecules, uh, and given under small molecule control. This is a really, uh, large, collaborative effort with uh, University of California Riverside, including Ian Wielden and, and Sean Cutler. Um, and this has resulted in mostly published stuff, but, but I'll talk about some unpublished stuff too at the end of the talk. Okay, so, um, so we'll move on to the first part of this talk. Okay. Um, so the name of the game, if you're thinking about, um, a, at least from a B cell response for, um, uh, for a vaccine, um, is uh, deliver an immunogen get an immune response, and get the right sort of antibodies. And these right sort of antibodies that you really want to elicit for things that uh, mutate heavily, including influenza and SARS-CoV-2, are things called broadly neutralizing antibodies. Okay. So these are um, antibodies that are defined by um, uh, as things that can neutralize infection uh, if you give them uh, against a given virus. And if you can neutralize infection across viral subtypes, those are known as broadly neutralizing. One of the central challenges in, um, in, in giving immunogens and testing this is that these broadly neutralizing antibodies or PNAVs are produced in much lower quantities than your run-of-the-mill antibodies, which I'll call subtype-specific. Um, and, and these occur in response to natural infection, um, from g one's group, uh, unpublished and published work showed that, as well as vaccination. Um, we want to understand why, and we are doing this in the context of influenza. Um, so to do that, for the general audience, I need to go and give you a couple slides um, that may be boring to some, may be redundant for others, but hopefully necessary for the narrative. Um, the human genome itself encodes a set of antibody gene fragments, which give you some limited sequence diversity. Um, and the sequence diversity is encoded in those variable regions um, on antibodies. That diversity varies by who you ask, but let's say it's on the order of a million sequences or so. Um, and then the other kind of thing that you have to know is that um, typically on B cells, these are expressed as B cell receptors. When they're secreted, um, one common form, but not all the common forms, is something called an IgG. And if you just take um, the 
portion uh, these four domains, uh, the variable region and kind of a constant uh, region for the light and heavy chain, you can form something called a fab fragment, okay? So this fab fragment is artificial. It's an artificially engineered portion, um, but it's what I'll use today to describe kind of our work on this antibodies. That million um, uh, antibody sequences initially um, undergoes a Darwinian selection process when exposure to antigen, um, and it's called uh, affinity maturation. Um, there's a lot of biology here I'll skip over, but the bottom line is in you go a, um, a B cell expressing um, a B cell receptor with relatively weak affinity, and at the outset of this process, you have selection for memory B cells and plasma cells secreting IgG, where those sequences hopefully have a much higher affinity uh, or, or, or tighter affinity um, than that starting sequence. This is uh, kind of the classic paper from this is by Herm Eisen in the early 60s, um, where what he did in this experiment is he injected um, rabbits with a haptin, which is kind of a small molecule conjugate. Uh, and then what he did is he pulled out the Sarah of rabbit um, at different time points after that initial injection, and he determined the KD or dissociation constant. And so in other words, how, um, uh, how tight those antibodies bound that haptin. Um, what you do for these KDs, lower is tighter binders. And so what he found, and each of these colors, uh, circles represent different rabbits. Um, what he found is that as you increase in time, um, you decrease the KD or increase the affinity of those antibodies, okay? So this is kind of the first demonstration of this affinity maturation pathway. So the question that we sought to address is why these subtype-specific antibodies produce naturally at much higher abundances than BNAS, okay? I'm gonna give you, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the punchline right now. We still don't know, we have a hypothesis. Okay, uh, this is why this is unpublished. Um, but really kind of, if you think about this from a systems perspective, you can kind of have three hypotheses. One, you don't make the right precursor, the million or so precursor antibodies. You don't get that precursor antibody in the sufficient abundances, okay? The other is that that selection during affinity maturation um, somehow favors one, uh, one set of sequences over the others, right? The run of the mill guys outcompete these broadly neutralizing guys during affinity maturation. And then finally, um, and something we don't have a great answer to, but maybe Jiwan's lab does, is that differentiation step. So um, once you go and get out of that step um, from those germinal centers, to differentiation to these long-lived plasma cells, um, maybe that there's a difference there, that step. So we wanted to kind of address that. And we wanted to just ask one piece of that puzzle, and, and what we asked is whether the affinity and maturation pathways alone of broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNAVs are different than these run-of-the-mill antibodies. And the idea behind this is as follows. If you have, uh, for a BNAV, if you have to take, um, if only one mutation improves affinity of all the possible mutations you can make, and then a second one, and then a third one, it's very rare that you would find the right pathway, the right route through the forest to go to get to those good developed BNAVs. Um, by contrast, if you have kind of a run-of-the-mill antibody, which is kind of shown in orange, many different mutations can go and increase affinity at once. Okay. So we wanted to test this hypothesis. Um, and, and, and we wrote an R01, we got it funded. <laughs> we sat down and we were like, well, okay, well, we know where these BNAV sequences are because they're rare and so they've been published a lot on. But how do we actually find these run-of-the-mill antibodies? How do we go and find the right control group? Um, identifying these naive human antibodies is very challenging. So my collaborator, Jenna at CU Inches, she says like, well, you know, 80% of the population gets infected within five years of a new strain. So you get influenza, new influenza subtype appears. 80% of the population is going to get it within five years. And so how do you get those run-of-the-mill antibodies? No one goes and fishes for kind of unextraordinary, ordinary antibodies. Um, so, I mean, it's fortunate for science and bad for the rest of the world. Um, SARS-CoV-2 gave a natural experiment on human exposure uh, to new viral surface antigens. And so um, one of the outshoots of that is that dozens to hundreds of labs rush to publish their studies on monoclonal antibodies. And these turned out, most of these turned out to be um, subtype-specific or run-of-the-mill, right? 
Um, and so we have our control group. We're going to go and really test and, and ask in this subset of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, we can go and see what run-of-the-mill antibodies look like and how they develop. Okay. So how we're doing this, how we're doing this experiment is we take um, the mature antibody and we um, infer the unmutated antibody or common ancestor for that, and we um, look at the evolutionary trajectories of those. So what we do is we make all common additions uh, between that starting um, uh, unmutated common ancestor sequence and the mature antibody, and we plot which is the likely development trajectory for those antibody sequences. How this works, um, I'm showing you this for uh, a, a given run-of-the-mill antibody called 4A8, which is otherwise unexceptionable. Um, there are four, six mutations from that universal common ancestor sequence, or UCA. This, is, um, this antibody is specific to the original strain um, uh, of the virus. We make a combinatorial library of all 64 possible combinations, uh, two to the six or 64, between that starting sequence and the mature sequence. Um, we use a yeast fab display platform to go and express this on the surface of yeast. And then we go and you perform isogenic cell surface titrations. And so what I'm plotting you here is a, uh, a fluorescence uh, that correlates with binding of the protein as a function of the concentration of the protein. And so you get a, a saturation curve or an isotherm binding curve. And from that, the half maximal response is your KD. Okay. And so we can go and evaluate the dissociation constant, or KD, for each of those 64 variants. Um, we, uh, Monica in my lab, did this, um, did this four times uh, with biological replicates, um, and then converted this to delta-delta uh, G, or, or a Gibbs-free energy uh, change in binding upon mutation uh, for each of those 64 variants. The, uh, I'll come back to this, but the mean squared error on this is like fantastic. It's about what you can possibly get uh, by these measurements. And then finally, from that, you can map the maturation pathways. Okay. So this is the, the first uh, one that we'll demonstrate. And um, how she uh, did the maturation pathway or mapping those um, is what she did is she did something called um, one-hot encoding of these mutations. So each mutation she had at positions were encoded as a vector of either or, or, or uh, an element in a vector of either 0 or 1. So an I is a 0 in this case, and a methionine or M is a 1. Um, and then what she did is she developed a multi-order model um, for this. This multi-order model has um, all individual interactions. So this isoleucine to methionine mutation, there's a weight associated with that, plus a weight for this threonine to serine mutation, plus the combination of those two mutations, plus the combination of three mutations, right? And so if you do that, you end up with 63 possible uh, parameters into your model. So how many actually matter? What is the maturation pathway for this antibody? Okay, this is, this is the payoff slide, and it's really depressing. Um, so for this antibody, um, it turns out one mutation actually mattered, and three of them actually had appreciable weights for this. So what this means in practice is that anything, any of those mutations could happen in any order, and it didn't really matter, and one mutation made the binding a little better, and that's it. Okay, that's it. That's the maturation pathway. This is the affinity maturation pathway for this enzyme, okay. or excuse me, for this antibody. Okay, um, we didn't observe any uh, thing other than um, first order terms. So there's no um, two mutations uh, occurring, going and changing the binding affinity more than just one mutation singly in isolation. And, and in fact, one that, what, that one key mutation determines that pathway for chorate. Okay, so as you can imagine, the grad students in the audience imagining uh, running 248 isogenic cell surface titrations, making 64 isogenic mutations, going and stocking those yeast, it's probably pretty laborious. So what we did is we developed um, this deep mutational platform to allow us to detect these mutational trajectories in mass. So, um, so I, I showed you this earlier, and... Um, the, the really key things that we had to solve um, to develop, to have this kind of robust pipeline to go and determine KDs and mass are, are really two technical challenges. One is if you make mutations at both the variable heavy and the variable light gene, 
um, you have to go and, and find a way to couple those. And, and this is kind of a little inside baseball. But for these kind of measurements, we can use short read DNA sequencing, which limits us to about 300 or 400 nucleotides uh, in, in a stretch. And if mutations happen outside of that read length window in this figure, then you don't see them. Okay? So we had to find a way to get uh, to, to be able to, to go about 2,000 nucleotides, not just uh, 400. The second key technical challenge is we had to find a way to actually get KDs from sequencing data alone and how to do that. My group had published on uh, um, some small um, portions of this earlier on how to actually resolve that dissociation constant or those binding affinities, um, but we had to be able to do this um, accurately and um, with prediction of the error uncertainties. So the first challenge is, was easier, and that's resolving these couple of VHBO mutations. Um, and, and the way to do this has been known in the literature for some time. Um, if you have a bunch of mutations, what you can do is you can barcode or put a, a nucleic acid sequence that's different between each plasmid encoded um, sequence. And um, you can barcode that. And then you can assign a barcodes to, to, to variants by long read sequencing, for example, or some other technology. And then you perform the screener selection and you can count the barcodes. So, um, so that was pretty easy to do. Uh, what we did is, um, uh, how we did this is we put a barcode in our plasmid ahead of time. Um, and this just shows uh, we, we inserted this at um, a place in the plasmid where we have a fluorescent protein expressed. And so if you, we excise that fluorescent protein, um, then the colonies will be white instead of pink or red. Okay? Um, and so we can go and add that barcode in, and we know that, that all of those plasmids, or most of those plasmids, 98% of them, have that barcode in it. The second thing we can do is, uh, the other kind of trick we had, is we hid um, distinct sites that are called restriction sites that you can go and perform an intramolecular ligation of your plasmid to go and put that, that barcode in proximity to both the H3 um, for, or the, the main um, uh, diversity determinant for that VH gene or in proximity to the same thing for the VL, for that light uh, variable region. Okay. So if you do that intramolecular ligation, that barcode is now close to that VH, and you can do short read sequencing for that, or it's separately to that VL, and you can do short read sequencing to that. Okay. Um, so Izzy Strawn and my lab developed the molecular biology for this, and it works really well. Um, there's all these controls, but the payoffs are, are slide or are, are lanes four, where you can see essentially a single plasmid for that intramolecular ligation step, and slide seven or lane seven, where you can see a single a single band right there, okay? Um, okay, and, um, and, and the advantage on this is that it scales about tenfold more than long read sequencing. So we can do about 10 times the capacity for this. All right, so the, the harder technical challenge is actually resolving um, variant-specific KD from sequencing data. I don't see anyone asleep yet in the audience, so I'm going to try, I'm going to try to let, tread lightly. I always tell my students that, uh, uh, like Stephen Hawking famously said, how many people have read Stephen Hawking's kind of, uh, I forget the book's name. Brief History of Time. How many people have read it? Okay. Do you remember what he said about equations? How many equations you can put in the book? You, you, you volunteered, right? <laughs> So he, it's his scaling law is the number of equations. Each equation you add to the book halves the readership, right? So I'm going to try to do this without equations. We'll see how I go. Okay. Um, so um, when you when you perform uh, flow cytometry, what you're getting out is a fluorescent. So for a given uh, variant, so given what that means is that if you have um, a yeast and they all express the same clone, there's a distribution of fluorescence. Uh, values with that binding channel. And it turns out that distribution turns, turns out to be log normally distributed. Okay? So what that means is that the mean is not at this peak here, the mean kind of is a little off centered. Okay? So the other thing that's kind of weird about flow cytometry data, and I encourage people who do that to, to go and look at it, is the standard deviation is uniform um, regardless of um, uh, the, the standard deviation in log normal terms is uniform, regardless of the um, intensity, the mean intensity. 
Um, and so what that allows us to do is that if you're collecting things above some fluorescent threshold and you know um, and you know how uh, you know how much of your population you collect for each of these variants, this blue and this black and this red one, you can actually work out what that mean fluorescence is at that labeling concentration. And what that allows you to do is plot for a given labeling concentration kind of one point of the line. So if you can do that 10 times, then you can recreate these isotherms and back out what your KD would be. Um, in, in practice, it's a little more sophisticated, but uh, I'm listening to Stephen Hawking <laughs> for this. Um, so what we did is we tested this with three antibodies at once. Um, we did this at 12 labeling concentrations, and we did this for about 2,000 uh, fold range in, in, um, in, in concentration. Um, when we back out the KDs, this is fluorescence versus concentration for four representative variants, we get really nice titration curves uh, for each of these. Um, and then when we actually plot um, uh, the KD by this maximum likelihood estimation versus uh, isogenic titration, um, we get a mean squared error under the um, mean squared error that you can get by isogenic titration. So we're pretty spot on, and we're, we're pretty confident that we're getting accurate values. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just say we got a lot of pain for that as years, uh, probably five student years uh, across Brian and Monica to develop this platform. And when we start making a uh, larger analysis, um, we show limited differences in maturation pathways. They kind of look like this 4 8 example. There's a couple key mutation that can happen in any order, and that's it. Okay, so it's kind of boring, right? They, they kind of go downhill in affinity, but you know, it seems like there's just one or two mutations that work, and then they go through the churn uh, for the rest of the time. Okay, so this comes back to our original question. So our hypothesis that we have is wrong. Um, it's a good thing they still gave us the money to do this. <laughs> um, but um, the, the real question is, well, if this is unexceptional, if the development is unexceptional, what explains the differences in affinity maturation success rates initially? Okay. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is going back to Hermisen's work from the early 60s, and I'm extrapolating out what that KD would be at, time, at week zero after infection, so what those initial antibodies would look like. Okay. Um, and so what we did is the simplest experiment we, we possibly could do. Um, Monica made uh, a dozens of these UCAs. This slide hasn't been updated, so I don't, um, but it looks about the same with updated. Um, but what she did is she just measured the monovalent KD uh, for these subtype specific antibodies and compared them to the uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. There's some preliminary results we haven't published yet. There's some things we have to check. But if you're looking at this difference, it's significant, both statistically, but also um, uh, it's not only that, but the, the difference is actually huge. It's 20-fold difference in starting affinities for these UCIs. The geometric mean for these subtype specific antibodies are in the hundreds of nanomolar. Um, to put that in context, the mature monovalent KDs really are about 10 nanomolar okay, um, at the limit. So we're, we're close or within striking distance of, of that limit um, from the get-go. And so um, the model that we're working with right now is that it's really not the case that um, everything starts at this blue line here, and one goes down, and one kind of goes this way. It's really, you know, one, uh, these subtype specific ones start on third base. Um, and they have much less um, maturation, even though that maturation pathway is unexceptional. Okay, so that kind of leads to the next question, and this is something that after we finish uh, this paper, uh, I really want to get to, and I, I think it's the central challenge. And, and the real challenge is why are uh, some surfaces immunodominant? Why do some surfaces seem to attract antibodies much better than others? Um, and, and what is the mechanism for that? And I, I don't have an answer uh, for you today, but that's something that really we're, we're uh, it's occupying the time I have to think. Um, okay, so that's the first part. Uh, the next part goes a lot faster because it's a more polished story, because it's published. Um, but we're using um, this data-driven protein engineering to tackle the grand challenge of understanding immune dominance. Um, we've developed that yeast uh, platform to track antibody development trajectories in vitro. Um, 
preliminary results are that these natural human antibodies are, have these uh, really sparse development pathways. Um, and preliminary as well, there are clear differences in monovalent binding affinities between the UCAs of these uh, two types of antibodies, the run-of-the-mill and the extraordinary. And we think that these differences, uh, in part, can result in the differences in success rates, or why we don't see these, these more exceptional antibodies. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and be much more um, engineering uh, for, the, for this last part. And I just want you to kind of think, um, what the, one third of my lab, what we really focus on is developing platforms for small molecule control of life. And um, what I'd like you to think about is if you could control um, or had genetically encoded biosensors for nearly any possible small molecule, what could you do? Um, most prosaically, and what we're funded for, you can do threat detection, right? You can sense TNT uh, by genetically encoded bacteria uh, or, or plants. Um, you can do toxicology screening on site. I was just reading in the New York Times uh, coming over how um, uh, people are getting tripped off and going to prison for um, basically uh, uh, turbidity testing for, for meth. Right, and they're spending time in prison. It turns out, you know, it's oil. Um, so, if you had much more accurate toxicology screening, that'd be transformative. Um, agrochemical control of plant traits, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, uh, more about that. But you can control plant traits in the field with small molecules, uh, real-time metabolite sensing, or building better microbes through the metabolic engineers in the audience. Behavioral modification with small molecule control. We do that already. It's called smoking. Um, druggable phage therapy, or you can go and turn on uh, uh, bacteria viruses with or without small molecules. Or even, and something we're, we're, we're looking really hard at, um, control of engineered cell therapies, where you can turn on or off platforms with, with uh, small molecule control. And so the big challenge for that is that building these general portable and tunable biosensors is hard. Okay? You can get them to work for certain systems, uh, but, but, but making them tunable and portable in general is hard. And I'll describe why. Um, the reason that's the case is that really you have two things you have to do. You have to do molecular recognition, which is binding, a non-covalent binding, and that turns out to be pretty easy to do. You can make antibodies against small molecules. But you have to transduce that to some output. And that output, that transduction event, turns out to be very difficult. So um, there's a lot of great work by, uh, for example, Watson Raman, who's now at Wisconsin, where you can go and engineer these transcription factors. You can go and make the binder, uh, these transcription factors bind different molecules, but they no longer transduce. They no longer turn on or off or bind to or um, bind away from DNA in response to the small molecules. Um, same things with GPCRs. You can go and uh, repurpose the GPCR pocket, a G protein coupled receptor, uh, to go and bind a small molecule, but then it interferes with the, the transduction machinery. Um, it, this is not restricted to proteins. You can also do this for um, RNA aftermers as well. Okay. So, um, so the story for me, for uh, my collaborators, it started much, much earlier than 2015. But the story for me started in 2015 uh, when, when my collaborator, Sean Cutler, um, published a paper in Nature. I just knocked my socks off. And what he showed in this paper is... Um, is, is he's a plant guy, and he had discovered this abscisic acid signaling molecule, this plant hormone receptor that um, senses a, a, a small molecule called abscisic acid, or ABA. Um, and what he did to it is pretty simple. He made some rudimentary changes to the binding pocket of this to, re to recognize instead of abscisic acid a, um, uh, an approved uh, agrochemical. Okay, so instead of an approved regulatory drug, it's an approved agrochemical. You can spray it in the field. Um, and then this, uh, this uh, general platform um, controls drought tolerance in the field. So you could go and turn on drought tolerance pathways by spraying that small molecule. And, and, and this is the wild type plant, and this is the transgenic line expressing that engineered receptor. And that's the only difference in that plant. And you spray the small molecule, and, and one plant lives and one dies. So I, I talked to Sean after this paper came out. I was, I was blown away, and, and I wanted to do something in this space for a while. Um, and I read a lot more about how uh, these hormone receptors work. And how they work uh, is really fascinating. They use something called chemically induced dimerization, or CID mechanism, uh, to control uh, plant traits. And, and all that means is that the receptor protein is a monomer in isolation, in this purple and these different examples. 
if it binds a small molecule, there's a conformational change in that protein, which can now be recognized by a second protein in green. Okay. And so the joining together of two proteins can trigger things as, um, as different as germination or, um, um, or drought tolerance in plants. We did the math on this. No one had actually done it. Uh, one of the advantages of engineers working in, plant, uh, in a plant field. And, um, and what's great about these is that they observe saturable kinetics. And so what that means um, is that the binding isotherm is saturable. So if you form complex, this ternary complex here, in response to that small molecule ligand, you can actually get uh, an EC50 uh, or um, a concentration at 50% complex formation, uh, as well as a satur saturable signal. So if you increase ligand past this line, it doesn't go down, okay? The other thing is that there's been um, decades of work on um, engineered CIDs from the chemical biology literature, starting with Stuart Schreiber, um, on repurposing different aspects of life uh, for different CID mechanisms. So there's a huge literature on controlling activation of transcription using these CID networks, or you can perform ELISA-like immunoassays. You can split a protein uh, in half, and you can complement it when those two proteins are in local proximity, restoring function. Um, or you can even have complicated protease activation networks. Um, and so this portability of these sensors were really attractive to me because it enables coupling of the same sensor to a diverse range of signal outputs. Okay? So if you could change that binding pocket to do a different small molecule, you didn't have to redevelop the system again. You didn't have to waste five years of a student's life doing that. The last thing that's really uh, amazing for me, and, 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 and it was non-obvious initially, but we ran through the map and it, and it turned out um, to be true, is that um, if you think about this ternary system, um, well, what happens if you have a huge excess of this green protein? You drive this reaction to the right by the chef principle, right? Or if you have a huge amount of this protein um, and a little bit of this protein, the same effect occurs. And so, in fact, if you look at the EC50 as a function of this green protein concentration, you can change that EC50 by over two orders of magnitude or over a hundredfold um, just, uh, just by, by increasing that balance. Okay. So this is amazing because that allows you to have for that same sensor to tune that EC50, not by changing, by protein engineering the pocket, but by changing the expression level of those two proteins. And then finally, um, we didn't know this when we started on the system, but it, it looked right, and so we, uh, we went ahead with it. Um, if you go and um, you look at the mutations for this engineered receptor from Sean uh, in 2015, um, those mutations are shown in pink here. This purple is the small molecule, mandipropamine, that's the agrochemical. And this green guy is that um, binding partner. And if you look at where those mutations are, they're away from this green partner. Um, and they, um, and if you go and you measure this binding constant, this KD2, um, for the natural receptor and the engineered receptor, those KD2s are indistinguishable. So what that means is that you can change that binding pocket and you'll still be able to recruit that second protein. So this is the last piece that we really wanted this generality for this system. Okay, so the question we asked were, um, can those sensors be engineered to bind diverse chemicals? So could we actually, with all the advantages of the system, could we actually get it to work and bind diverse chemicals? Um, so to do this, we use computational design uh, to design the, the binding pocket. And what we did is instead of designing that binding pocket for given chemicals, we said, okay, what is likely to fold? And what is likely to result in chemically interesting surfaces on the inside of that pocket? Um, so PJ Steiner did this in my group. Um, we designed this library and then we used uh, a couple techniques we've invented in the lab to go and encode um, a mutational library uh, of this, and we did this in plasmid. Um, and then what we did is we, um, we transformed this into yeast, and we used a technique called yeast-2 hybrid, which is a genetic selection uh, for, um, uh, for um, whether this receptor is activated by that ligand of interest. And so if it is, the yeast cells grow, um, and if it's not, they die. We also have this activated to 
a, a colorimetric readout as well. So after the yeast cells that grow that live, we can go and run uh, analysis after the fact. So we first tested this. I don't know why Sean did this. Uh, he's in Riverside. I think they legalized pot recently. So he decided to go and test a huge uh, suite of synthetic and natural cannabinoids. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the chemical structures of these different uh, natural and synthetic cannabinoids. Um, this, like, JWH193 is, like, spice if you go to your, uh, or K2 if you go to, like, your head shop in town. Is there a head shop in town? I probably don't want to know that. Um, so, uh, so each column here represents uh, concentration uh, uh, that the yeast are incubated at uh, for the given molecule, and blue indicates that we have sensitivity. And so you can have sensitivity in some cases to 2.5 micromolar, some cases to nanomolar concentration, uh, a lot of the cases um, at, at medium to high micromolars initially from this library. Um, we can go and do the same trick for organophosphates, and so these are um, uh, different classes of organophosphates that we did this for. Um, and what we can do after that is you can do a standard directed evolution to go and make them much more um, potent uh, sensors. Um, if you do that, I'm showing you here uh, two examples. We have this methyl and diazinon, and, and kind of uh, are, I'm showing or highlighting the chemical differences. So they're, they're different by a couple methyl groups, right? Um, but if you show uh, cross reactivity, they're, they're pretty good. Um, they're, they're, they're not um, general sensors. They're, they're actually pretty specific for their intended ligand. Okay. Um, I kind of uh, already talked about this, but these, these sensors, but we had to demonstrate this for this paper, we, they're, they're portable across in vitro and in vivo sensing modalities. So you can go and hook up uh, enzyme inhibition assays or uh, complementation for split uh, uh, luciferase. So that's what this luminescence uh, shows um, uh, transcriptional activation um, or even a lyso like amino assay. Um, and what I'm showing in all these are the y axis is that response as a function of a small molecule. And we can show that this worked for um, representative uh, sensors. So we could show that we can get the same kind of responsiveness for, for different sensors. This sensor uh, rep, uh, senses a synthetic cannabinoid called 4F, and this one senses one called WIN. Yeah. Um, so we spent, so my group spent a little time uh, uh, developing these assays, the immunoassays, uh, at least. Ian Wielden's group did a lot of work for everything else. Uh, Shuang Wei and his lab did that. Um, and then the reviews came back and they were like, well, yeah, these immunoassays kind of look trash. So we had to go, we had to go and get uh, a real expert. So we, we, um, we asked Wen Wen Shuang at UC Riverside uh, to do this uh, realistically with biologically relevant matrices. Um, and so she did this for sal saliva, urine, serum, and saline. And we got uh, really better looking dose response curves at limited detections that are clinically relevant. Okay? So these uh, proteins, these plant proteins out of the shelf after a little engineering uh, could go and, uh, and go and sense clinically relevant concentrations of these cannabinoids okay? and biologically relevant matrices. Um, Francis Peterson solved the structure for us of one of these uh, biosensors. And um, we, we found a structural basis of ligand recognition uh, where this win is in orange here. And then there's this little dot in red that you may or may not be able to see um, on the slides. And that's a water molecule. And, and what's really interesting about this is that this water molecule uh, really ties the room together, ties the sensor complex together uh, by forming two hydrogen bond donors and two acceptors, um, where one of the hydrogen bonds acceptor is from that, um, that ligand itself. Okay? Um, and if you start looking at some of these um, things that we're able to bind, um, that uh, hydrogen bond acceptor at prominent location I'm showing you kind of in yellow here pops out all over the pace. And, and what we think is that um, conformers of these ligands, so the, the confirmation, three-dimensional confirmation that ligand can hold, it's got to put that hydrogen bond acceptor in a certain location for, for a biosensor to form. Yes. Okay, so... Um, where we are now, and this is unpublished, and I am uh, aware of the time, so I will finish in four minutes on time. Um, the, we're, uh, there's a number of different directions uh, we're going to go in. Uh, Sean's group is really interested in the toxicology aspect of this. Can we go and make these sensors uh, and have like some kind of dipstick that you can go and test in the field and be field ready? Um, uh, Ian's, Ian Wilden's group at UCR is really interested in the metabolic engineering aspects. 
Uh, for me, I'm really interested in, in, in really taking us towards engineered cell therapies, where you're not only sensing uh, glycoproteins or different proteins in cell surfaces, but you can extend differences in metabolite concentrations, or you can turn on and off complicated responses with, with already approved drugs. And so the big challenge for our existing screen, so Sean has gone ahead and we have over 100 FDA-approved drug uh, sensors for a over 100 FDA-approved drugs. So we got that portion uh, knocked out. Uh, but for endogenous metabolites, something like kinurinin, which is uh, clinically relevant in, 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 for cancer, we can't use the, our, our used to hybrid screening platform because the, the yeast make kinurinin. Um, and so we have to use computational design to get close to the answer. The other thing that's kind of a challenge is that if you think about a dose response, um, if you're going to do things like cell killing, um, and uh, a non-cancerous concentration of kinurinin is like only threefold different than the tumor microenvironment or the TME, um, then you don't want to turn in 50% of your cell killing at that point, right? You really want to have some kind of more of a, a, a binary response. We don't have that portion working out yet, uh, but what Sam uh, Swift in my lab has done is inverted this switch. Um, so we can turn off um, uh, a, a uh, pathway at high ligand concentration. And the way he did this is pretty simple. Um, we just, uh, it's really easy to design a protein that binds um, the partner protein in the absence of ligand. Um, you've just got to use these display to go and make mutations that improve that native recognition. Um, and so you have this pathway working, and then um, the ligand-dependent protein can outcompete um, the guy that, that um, uh, outcompete and sequester um, this, this portion um, inactivating that complex. All right. So that turns out to work pretty well. Um, I will skip this. Right, yeah. So um, we wanted to design... Uh, we did design in a positive control. It didn't work. What are we missing? So what we did is we did our deep mutational scanning on um, existing sensors, and we really tried to understand what we're missing in the in the in the sensor pathway and why we're um, why we're missing um, some mutations. Um, we also wa worked with Michael Schertz in in my department uh, to do molecular dynamics. Our hypothesis is that water was important, and so we wanted to know if that water really was important and if molecular dynamics is consistent with our intu intuition, um, and, and it was, which is great. Um, and we were like, okay, well, what are we getting wrong? And um, it turns out we're getting all of the Van der Waals stuff pretty much right. Um, so the mutations we're picking up. Oh, right, yeah. Um, so these uh, are point mutations at a position. So the way to read this is this is position 87, this is leucine, and a mutation to isoleucine gives you a 1.5 kcalimole penalty. Okay? So 1.5 kcalimole is about tenfold worse binding affinity. Um, so, you know, so if you, you can model this by eye, you can be like, oh, okay, isoleucine will fit here, that's fine. Um, and, um, and, and really, the aliphatic positions, uh, we're getting them right by Rosetta, our, our prior computational protocol. But what we're getting really wrong is the electrostatics. So this R is a positively charged amino acid, and this E is a negatively charged amino acid. Okay? And so if you disrupt those mutations to anything other than the other positively charged amino acid or, or the other negatively charged amino acid, you get no binding at all in the system. Um, and what's odd is that these aren't directly contributing to binding. Okay? They're, they're, they're not um, interacting with that ligand. They're basically just sequestering themselves as salt bridges. Okay? And so we're, we're getting this wrong. And so that tells us how do we fix, uh, how do we fix the, the sensor design problem. Um, but in the last minute, I think, you know, where I'd like to end is that um, what I'm describing here is a task-specific problem. We have these sensors, this one protein, we got it wrong, we want to fix it, um, but that's really a task-specific problem. We have antibodies, we want to fix them a little bit, or antibodies against VEGF or whatever. Um, but the global problem is, I think, more interesting to me. And, um, and if you think about the global problem, um, you can get this by deep learning. Um, and where I'd end is that we need the data sets to be able to do that, and we don't have the data. So show me the data to do that. This is what I think we need. <laughs> uh, and um, it's a little biased, because it's what my lab does well. Uh, but, but 
the scale that's needed is uh, millions, millions of these kind of measurements and tens of thousands of structures. Um, I think we can get there, and that's kind of uh, you know where where I'm interested in pushing. So the two take homes for this portion, um, what I showed you is a system uh, platform technology for development of, of small molecule biosensors uh, sourced from a plant hormone receptor. And then um, the second thing I want to leave you with is, is really um, solving that molecular recognition problem. If we want to solve that or you want to think about this, um, what is the data needed and how do you actually pose that question? All right, I'll end here and take, I have some time for questions. Okay, great.